Board of Trustees, roll call, please. Trustee Lamb. Here. Trustee O'Rourke. Here. Trustee Peck. Here. Trustee Rasich. Trustee Wachowski. Here. Trustee Benucci. Here. Mayor Collins. Here. Can we rise for the pledge? We're seeking a motion to approve the minutes of the joint meeting of the President and the Board of Trustees and Plan Commission and the minutes of the executive session held on January 11th. My motion. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. That motion carries. Presidential comments? I have none this evening. Trustees' comments? I have a, a couple of comments, I guess. It, it's recently come to my attention, at least, I guess, that there is a traffic um, issue in the morning over on 248th Avenue. I guess it would be north of 127th Street near Plainfield North. And my understanding is I think that there's been a number of warnings, I guess, for people driving around the vehicles, pulling into the parking lot, crossing into the center lane. And I think <coughs> the chief and the department's been good about kind of issuing warnings to people. But it seems to me like maybe that period is ending now. So I guess I just wanted to kind of notify or let people understand and maybe get confirmation from the police department that they're going to start enforcing that better there's no in talking with the chief I don't think there's any good alternatives short-term alternatives to solving the issue so unfortunately they're gonna have to start enforcing the laws and so I guess what I would ask is and maybe you can make a mention of it there if you're taking that route you might want to consider alternative routes because it's not going to get any better anytime soon I guess and unfortunately now if you're stuck and you try to go around you might get ticketed is that correct Yes, that's uh, absolutely correct. Talking to the chief and uh, along with Sergeant Eric Munson, he's well aware of the issue. He's got a couple of his traffic officers concentrating on that particular area uh, and upping the enforcement for that in which can be cited. Um, as Trustee O'Rourke mentioned, by all means, we would just ask the residents that normally travel that route to consider alternative routes to allow for the ease in and ease out of those um, students, families dropping off, picking up their uh, their students there at the high school. Perfect. Thank you. And the other al the other comment I just wanted to make, I didn't know if everybody is aware, but it, it, again, it, I believe the state, from a license plate renewal perspective, has stopped sending reminders. And I know a couple of people that I'm aware of didn't understand that, didn't realize that their plates have been expired. So. Anybody in the audience or people listening might want to go out and check their vehicles and make sure that their plates have not expired or if they are going to expire, you're not going to get a reminder notice in the mail. So you need to go on the state's website and renew it uh, through the Internet. Is that correct as well? Yes, I, I do believe that the state of Illinois also set up a like an email alert system in which you can actually register your email to get the alerts via email. So, again, I would strongly recommend that you take the time to go on to the, their website and do that and not only that mention it to your friends your families and as the trustee mentioned take a look at your own car because shockingly enough there's there's several out there and unbeknown to several people that the state had stopped that service thank you are there any other trustee comments if not this would be the time for public comments there are no public comments and we'll proceed with the workshop meeting first item on the agenda is Plainfield Library District proposed expansion thank you very much uh, tonight we have uh, some members of the uh, Plainfield Public uh, Li Plainfield Township Public Library uh, Board of Directors and staff is the township name still in it or not it's dropped okay I was getting a funny look there. I thought, oh, gosh, there might be the township still in there. Uh, to uh, speak to the uh, upcoming um, uh, proposed uh, tax levy question and uh, library expansion project. As you know, we normally don't uh, uh, wade into the waters of other taxing jurisdictions uh, to let them instead uh, uh, speak to the community directly. However, we invited in uh, the library uh, folks today mostly because uh, well we're the only group that has uh, uh, this uh, broadcast over uh, cable access television and we have our YouTube channel and we thought it was a good community service to provide uh, to to the uh, residents so uh, with that we'll turn it over to uh, Carl and uh, Julie 
Could you dim the lights a little bit so they can see that? Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Carl Gilmore, and I am the president of the Plainfield Public Library District Board of Trustees. Tonight, I'm here with Director Julie Milovec, as well as Eric Penny, our uh, representative of Nagel Hartray Architecture. And we will be presenting to you this evening just some general information about expansion plans for the library district and the process that we have uh, to reach the decisions that we have. Uh, before I start that, I do want to remind everyone of a couple of things, uh, namely the mission of the library, which is to educate, captivate, and connect, as well as our mission, our vision statement uh, in service of that mission, which is that the Plainfield Public Library District provides excellent library services to satisfy the educational, informational, entertainment, and inspirational needs of community residents throughout their lives. The library is a community center where residents connect with resources, with each other, and with their community identity. The library leverages technology and human capital to give residents access to services and resources, not only at the library's physical location, but also throughout the community in partnership with other organizations and via virtual services. The library is a vibrant and visible presence in the community, making residents aware of 21st century library services and our library's unique character. And we really have used that vision statement to guide the process that we have undergone in trying to make sure that we are fulfilling that commitment to our community and our district. This process has been going on for quite some time. Eric is going to go through a detailed explanation of the specific process that we used to arrive at the plan uh, that we have presented for which you can see a 3D model here and which has resulted in the two referenda questions that will be placed before the public on the ballot in March. Um, what I would like to do is to give a little bit of background as to the longer term process that we have undergone in terms of making sure that we are meeting the needs of the library district. Um, Back as uh, far as 1991, which was shortly after our 1990 expansion, the library and board quickly deduced uh, that the uh, expansion to 27,000 square feet from the original 1940, 2700 square foot building was already going to be woefully short of future projections as uh, we realized that within 10 years had met a 20 year projection for the population of the library district. And this was consistent with other areas of the local community, both public and private, which saw similar rapid expansion and have also grown to serve their particular constituencies, including the village, the police and fire protection districts, the park district, and the school district. So to accommodate these anticipated changes, the library reviewed its place in the community and its supports and is supported by and we expanded our service offerings in terms of programs within the library, outreach efforts, access to advances in technology, and strategic partnerships with many local bodies, while being careful to also increase the variety and availability of materials for our patrons. These changes were included as part of a 2006 to 2010 long range plan. The conclusion of that plan included the possibility of a physical expansion of the library facilities which had been held until later in that period, recognizing that we had a 20-year bond from the 1990 expansion to pay off before we wanted to issue new bonds. So in 2009, the first attempt to meet those needs, a referendum, was placed on the ballot in an attempt to grow through an addition to the existing library building, as well as a new branch location. Fortunately, the economic downturn that affected so many across the country, but especially in rapidly growing areas like ours, resulted in the defeat of that referendum. Needing to continue planning for the future, the board shifted to a more agile strategic plan model rather than another long range, reflecting the need to define overall goals that would eventually result in the still necessary expansion of physical facilities while providing guidance for continued operation in the meantime. We continued to seek community input for development of that strategic plan knowing that patron involvement in the evaluation and expansion process would be central to good planning and the ultimate success of any growth project. A ballot measure was considered for 2012, 
but based on community member sentiment indicating that they did not support expansion at the time, the board decided not to go to referendum at that time. Uh, additionally, in 2012, the Board of Trustees worked with KJWW Engineering to evaluate the building and infrastructure needs of the library in the immediate term, from three to five years out, and in the long term. More than $1.2 million in necessary work was identified just to keep the current building in operable condition. Our Special Reserve Fund, the library's capital fund, was used to undertake the immediate term project which includes replacement of the HVAC and control systems, windows, and a shingled portion of the roof. A long-range budget plan was developed and approved in 2013 to ensure that the library would be financially able to make the necessary repairs and replacements as identified in the 2012 building evaluation. The plan included reorganization of staff to meet those financial needs by setting aside $95,000 per year over the next four years for the necessary work on the building. Much of this work has been done, but more remains beyond the funding already set aside. In 2014, as the immediate and medium term infrastructure work was being completed, the board recognized that additional work would still need to begin affecting major areas of the building's overall operations and structure. At the same time, growth in population began again in earnest and a general economic optimism started to be felt. Rather than committing to long-range work that would be indicative of staying in the current facility for the foreseeable future, and recognizing that that space was unsuitable for continuing to house growing programs and a 21st century library, the library contracted with Anders Dahlgren to update his 2008 work on a space needs analysis of the library realizing that the new projections continued to speak to additional space required beyond the current facility, we began to explore, with the help of owner's representative Graham Harwood of CCS International, the possibilities for expanding the library within the district, and hired Nagel Hartray Architecture in March of 2015 to begin the preliminary design and budgetary processes to be able to come to the public with an expansion plan and referenda possibilities for the March 2016 ballot. That process is laid out on this projected slide. In addition to our regular monthly board meetings, we held several special public meetings and gathered a citizens task force to help guide us and the staff in developing a plan that would meet the district's immediate needs as well as into the future for a 21st century library. There were 22 meetings in all, as well as a commissioned phone poll, which provided the input we needed to plan as well as guidance for what the tolerance of the community would be for the funding of that building project. These meetings culminated in our December 2015 decision to place two referenda questions on the March 2016 ballot, a $39 million 20-year building bond and a limiting rate tax increase to fund its operation. It has always been a stated goal of this board to present a plan that would reflect the community's needs and preferences so that it would be successful. To that end, we will continue to solicit their assistance in finalizing the de design of the building once the referenda are approved. And Eric Penny, our architect, will now present the details of that plan and uh, how it will be executed if the referenda do pass. Good evening. Uh, you're going to have to bear with me here. I'm going to attempt to summarize in a short period of time what we talked about for 22 meetings, almost a year. <laughs> so there was a lot in there. We're going to leave out a few things along the way, but I'm going to try and give you an overall flavor of, of the whole thing. Advance slide, please. We started with site selection, and uh, we really were looking at two, two sites when we first started. The existing library site and a site located out on Van Dyke uh, Road which is where the metro station, well, long time planned metro station that isn't going forward was planned to, to be located. Uh, as part of studying those sites, we did some physical test fits to see what we could fit on the site with the program that was developed at the time uh, based on the 90,000 square feet and, and the amount of parking we would need to, to go along with that. Uh, it, we w met with the public committee, the public, open public meeting, and the uh, task force, uh, both separately about this, and we went through all this and had a wide range of discussion. And really, 
uh, there was a great deal of consensus that the existing library site was the ideal site for the library. That it's, in the, it's socially and emotionally the heart of the, the community. It, it supports the traffic to it, supports the business district. The business district also supports it. And it's in a central, unbiased location in the village. The Greenfield site was just seen as too remote with too many neighboring uses that weren't really beneficial to the library, including the, uh, the train, uh, the, the light industrial sites, uh, and a lack of general pedestrian access. So when, it, when we took a vote, uh, we'd like to say unanimous, I hate to say that, but no one voted for the Greenfield site. We, we, we got continual feedback that the existing library site was the route to go. Looking at the ex existing site, we looked at it five ways to start with. The first way on the far right is a renovation. And that's expanding the existing library. And that's uh, what we did is we looked at expanding it due north, extending the bays of the library. It, it makes the most sense because of the, the way the bays are laid out to continue the collection in that direction. Uh, and then uh, we also looked at four schemes for new construction on the site. And those schemes were based around the idea that we had to keep the existing library functioning while we went through construction. So they're located on the portions of the site that where the library isn't. One of the real limitations of the site is the library is really stuck up into that southwest corner of the site, very close to the lot line, very close to the church next door. It really limits your options for expansion. Another limiting factor in the development of the site is water reclamation requirements. Um, no longer can we just do what we want on sites, we have to store the rainwater that comes down on them. And what we're intending in all these schemes or that underneath the parking lot. It's kind of a gravel retention basin that holds water from heavy rainstorms until it can uh, go more slowly into the stormwater system. And we use the civil engineer to kind of roughly size that and pretty much all the parking area is going to be storm retention or other utilities. Looking at the, at the uh, addition, there's a real couple planning limitations there that come on. When we put the building, expand the building further north to fit a 90,000 square foot program, it really filled up the whole frontage of Illinois Street. It's going to be a, a long building along there and essentially in some ways it creates a wall between the parking and the downtown. And one of the things we've come to appreciate the more we've been out here, the longer we've worked on the project, is how much that parking is shared with the downtown. I've never been out here where I didn't see someone who was going to dinner as well as going to the library and using that parking. And one of our big concerns about that particular scheme is that this parking, uh, right now you, for most libraries, you walk a long ways to get to the front door. That's usually a complaint. For, you do the same for, to get to downtown. If we add it on on that side, it's an even longer walk, and I think one we wouldn't expect people to make. We'd expect a lot of people to come down the alley between, kind of a severe angle here, <laughs> between, the, between the church and the, and the older building next to it, and that alley would be kind of become a quasi-public thoroughfare for pedestrians. We don't think that's a great idea. The other thing is, as we looked at that renovation site, we just cannot get 90,000 square feet a building on the site and adequate parking. You're gonna have less parking than you have now with a bigger building on the site. Looking at the new construction, we looked at it several ways with a building along 59, uh, a building that tries to take more of an, an L shape along 59, uh, and a building across the north and a kind of a variation of those in between. And one of the things we quickly realized is that, again, with a 90,000 square foot building, we were gonna have to park underneath it to get the parking counts we needed. That requires a ramp that gets down in underneath the building, requires different access to the site. It kind of complicates the site matters, but we just didn't have enough site left to get the counts up. Uh, as, we were as we were developing and discussing these schemes with the, with the public and the task force, again, uh, you end up with a building when we situate around, uh, along 59, where the entrance should really face the parking lot, and you kind of have the back of the building. The entrance is kind of hidden from Route 59. One of the things we thought we sh could, should really improve upon this time around is to have this, the entrance more visible for more areas of the site, especially with the larger library. Uh, the, 
that kind of affected these two center schemes. It also kind of really limits the access and the visibility from Route 59. It's the major road through there. You really end up with just driveways at each end and very little room for landscaping left on the site. So we started looking at the two options that stretch the building across the north end of the site. We quickly realized, and I think the, the public meeting really emphasized this, that how nice it was to have the library face downtown, be able to have a full vision of the front from 59 and from Illinois Street. So it was kind of something that uh, wasn't necessarily intentional at the first, but really became a benefit to the whole scheme. Uh, as we went through again, we took a, a vote from everyone and it was pretty much unanimous again that concepts two and five were the preferred schemes. Uh, they, they provided easy vehicular access from 59 and Illinois Street. Uh, it faced downtown. The parking is located near the building entrance, which is improvement over the existing, but it's also situated where it's easier to use from downtown. Uh, one of the things that was a concern is when we're looking at 90,000 square feet, how's that going to fit into that area? That's a big building. Uh, that was a challenge. So when we took a vote, concepts two and five were chosen. Uh, by, by the public and the task force and supported by the library, but we also recommended that we further explore adding on to the existing building. We didn't feel like we'd gone into enough depth for that and that we really owed it to the community to kind of take a deeper look at that option. Next. So we, we then went back and tested the site in more depth in a couple ways. Three schemes of the renovation and then three schemes as new construction. We started with the scheme with the renovation of 90,000 square feet with the idea we were going to magically find more room for parking on this site and <laughs> to make this better. It didn't take long studying this to realize we just can't fit a building of that size on the site and meet the parking needs uh, of the library and the downtown area. Uh, it, you really end up with a big building that gives you very poor access to Illinois Street. We needed to find a way to get two-way traffic across. Uh, drop up and pick up of, the, up of a book return systems and things needs to happen on the driver's side. The car works best off of one lane, one direction roads. So there's some real challenges that were in there. The other thing as we discuss this with the library is right now you've got a building that's half into the ground. And it's really not a good idea to put an addition on there that's offset from the existing building because libraries are generally staffed per floor. If you offset it from the existing building, you end up with five floor plates that you're staffing instead of three floor plates that you're staffing. That doesn't break very well down in the way typically libraries are, are organized, and it creates an operational complication. It's not as flexible. It's also not as cost effective to operate that way. So we decided to take a step back further and look harder at the program size and the existing building as to what else we could do to that. Looking at the existing building, as we dug into it deeper, there are some inherent issues with the building. I think uh, one of them that was built in 1989 just happened to be not the best time to build new buildings because it was right before American Disabilities Act came out with accessibility issues coming to the forefront, right before major changes in life safety codes, and also right before technology began to be implemented in public buildings. You know, the internet was a rumor kind of at this point in time. If you put two computers in, it was considered very progressive. And now, you know, two computers doesn't serve anybody at the library. And those kind of limitations are kind of a have a long-term effect on the operation of the library. Uh, there are also some other inherent issues with it. There was a lot of effort made to fit it around that existing uh, original library, but that half that original library was underground. So half of this building is underground. The only portion, this is the lower plan here, that gets good daylight is right in the center and that was achieved by pulling the earth back away from the building at that point. Well, if you try and do that for a larger area, you're going to start sacrificing site area and parking and so forth. You're getting up with kind of a moat along the face of that building to really get light usable space. Uh, libraries are different now than they were in 1989. We don't just expect people to come in and check out a book. We expect them to spend hours there. Daylight is something that's become essential towards that kind of functioning of the library. We also have uh, various issues. The way you enter the building is uh, not very efficient. You enter into a very small 
floor plate in front of everything, you're immediately confronted by the stairs. Now, why the elevator satisfies the technical needs of the American Disabilities Act, it doesn't really solve the intent in which everyone comes into the building the same way. The other issue with that is you can take that elevator down to the lower level, which is over here. That's down a hallway and away from the main desk. So it's kind of an unsupervised area to a certain extent. It's not something we would ever recommend in a library to have that much space kind of out of your direct sight line all the time. You've not had issues that I know of with that, but it's not necessarily a good planning practice. Another issue is the number of stairs that are put in. These stairs are put in in a way that we're not allowed to do anymore. Four of the five stairs come down outside. We're not allowed to do that anymore. We have to enclose those stairs. We have to keep snow and ice off of them. We have to provide uh, area of rescue assistance for people with wheelchairs within them. It's a, it, it, this is slightly before the time when that was a code requirement. It's also not a good idea to have five ways to get out of a building that size. It's very hard to control security in those type of situations. It's just more doors you have to, to manage. Another issue and one we can solve is the main stair. It's a big hole in the middle of the building. It kind of gets in the way of your entrance flow when you come in the building. It projects noise. It's a very inefficient way. It kind of makes the building difficult to, to use. It's, it makes it so the collection is really broken and divided into two on each floor. That can be filled in. Uh, things that can't be addressed as easily are things like the uh, mechanical system. The codes have completely changed. Those need to be redone. Uh, the same thing with a lot of the electrical systems. The fact is when we're adding on to such a great deal to this building, you have to bring the existing building up to the current code. Also, we can't add on in a way where the library has to go and make major upgrades because we're going to be spending the library's available money. So what we build needs to last. It needs to, we're looking at 20 to 50 years, not a 10 year solution for any part of this. So that, that means renovating the building is going to be more expensive than just a simple uh, approach. The other thing that we can't really address is these orange dots are the column grid. We don't know quite why, but you'll notice there's a lot of columns in the center of the building. It's very unusual. I think uh, as an architect, I'll blame it on the architects and that we uh, practice a little architecture with the structure there. It was a time when we put a lot of columns in buildings and expressed them stylistically, and the problem with that is it makes it very inefficient for a library. There isn't a base spacing that's 30 feet on center in the direction we would normally have a standard base spacing in the building. It means it's very inefficient for laying out books and so forth. More importantly, it's, it's inefficient for laying out the things that libraries use today. They need more space and flexibility. All the columns in the way really cut into that ability to rearrange the building. Next slide, please. So having said that, we went back and looked at the existing building again and we said, if we're going to add on to the building, we're going to have to reduce the square footage down to something that will fit better on the site. And we targeted 70 to 75,000 square feet. We had a suspicion that we could make that work, but we weren't positive at the time. We tested it to see how that would fit. So this scheme has gotten shorter, it allows us to get a drive on the far, I'm just sorry. On the far left is the first scheme I'll talk about. Uh, Lockport's across the bottom, uh, Illinois Street up the side, 59 is on this. The addition coming off the north of the library now has gotten small enough we can get a, at least a drive out book drop area off of it. We can get a service drive, uh, an entrance drive out to Illinois Street. And it's a little bit easier to get around the end of the building to head towards downtown. But frankly, not a lot. We still don't think it's a good idea to route pedestrians past book drops and service drives and so forth on their way to downtown. It's not ideal by any means, but it does get us up into a parking count that is close to what you have now, uh, a substantial addition to the building. One of the problems with it is that when you take a building that's uh, 24 to 27,000 square feet and you add on 51,000, you align the floors, we're still going to end up with 40% of the building underground. We're gonna, that's going to affect the usability of the space, the suitability of that space for the various library uses going forward. It also means that you're going to have a third floor of a fairly limited size. Again, not an ideal staffing 
or operational breakdown for a library. Something more e equal breaks down better into the adult collection, the entrance floor with meeting rooms, and the children's floor. Uh, so it's an awkward, awkward arrangement. For that reason, we tested adding on to the east, north and east of the existing building. With, again, with the three-story addition aligned with the existing building. Uh, you get a very rational layout to a parking lot area. Uh, it Functionally, you get good act, much better access from both streets, uh, Illinois and Route 59. Uh, a lot of that stuff works out better. For a plan shape, that's not our favorite. You end up with a lot more interior space, kind of when you start elling the buildings around, and it gets a little less flexible in how things lay out within the building, especially when you've got existing construction with a lot of columns placed into it. I think the other thing that concerns us is when we do that, we can get the building contiguous, then we start having to get the entrance, the, the ser service drive, the book drop, everything is on the same face of the building. Again, not ideal to mix the pedestrians and the vehicular access across the same front. Then we took a look at the new construction. Again, this is the 90,000 square foot scheme. On the left is the site layout with the parking. On the right, we've just shown what an underground parking garage would look like there. Again, because the building's so big, it really takes up a lot of space on the site. We have to go to underground parking to kind of get the counts we need. The real problem we run in with this scheme isn't getting the right number of parking or anything. It's the expense of underground parking. When we, at this point in time, we're far enough into it, CCS International started looking at some budget numbers for things, and parking could be upwards of $6 million underground for 60 spaces. That's not a good value. There's a reason that we only do that in heavy downtown areas because the cost is so high, it just doesn't make sense here. Again, looking at the 90,000 square foot program, we realized it's just too big for the site. We either have to make the site substantially bigger got to make the building smaller. Again, we assumed 75,000 square foot program for both these areas. And all this didn't happen independently. At the time, Julie and her staff were working with the program consultant, looking at ways to tighten up the building size. At the same time, we were getting a better idea that we could make this size building work for the site. As you do that, it starts to open up more parking space on the physical site area. It, it started to make, uh, on the far left here, the scheme with the building all along the north. Uh, starts to make a lot of sense on the site. I think one of the things that makes too much sense is the driveway that goes straight across. Uh, what we, get, we learned from the library staff is people backed up on Route 59 are probably going to take that as a shortcut across, and that we need to offset that a little bit to make that less attractive to people. But uh, you can see the, the site and the building start to work together a lot better. The other thing that we did in this scheme is we got a service, a one-way service drive across the north end of the site. Uh, that's something we can start taking advantage of kind of the odd shape of the site to fit in a little bit more parking for staff up there. But then we start getting the one-way drive up there. We, it's much easier to get book drop, potentially a drive up window because this building, a new building does not have to line up with the existing building. It's basically setting on grade. You can, in that case, we can have a drive up window very easily that people can not only can you drop off your books, you can pick books up. We looked at another version of that, kind of splitting the difference in the big scheme we had on uh, that faced all on Route 59. This is an L-shaped scheme. See the parking and things doesn't lay out quite as efficiently. The building doesn't lay out quite as efficiently. It could work. Uh, the entrance is, is something you, you need to get kind of closer to the parking area. It's kind of hidden from Route 59. While it's, while it's workable, we just didn't feel it was as solid a scheme. But overall, I think eliminating the underground parking really reduced the cost of this approach. Uh, taking advantage of the staff, the parking at the top really works much better, the full service window. Everything is oriented towards the downtown area. The parking is very useful from downtown. Uh, we thought this worked out pretty well and could be made to work with a few site improvements. So we had these same discussions that we were having with the library staff, with the uh, public and the task force group, and we reviewed all these different options. Uh, everyone kind of agreed that the 70 to 75,000 square foot program looked like it made a lot more sense on the site. 
uh, that it, it still made sense that the building face downtown and provide clear access to downtown with easy access to parking. Uh, people recognize that the renovation was going to be a little bit more expensive than they thought. It's a major overhaul of all the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, life safety systems. Also, when you consider all that, renovation takes longer. It, uh, we can build a new building in 14, 15 months. Generally, an addition to this site is still going to take 14 months. Then you have to close the existing library, move it over, work on that for another seven, eight months, then open it up and move them back in again. All that costs money, too. Net effect is CCS International started putting the prices together. The cost of adding on to the building and getting the same quality construction out of it end up being equal, if not more, than new construction just because of the efficiencies that you have on the site with the new construction. Okay. So basically, we came back to the concept two of the new construction. Again, this was pretty much unanimous from everyone we, we talked to in the public in the task force. Uh, this just made, was the most, pro, most pragmatic solution to serve the long-term needs of the library. It's very efficient use of the site. The floor plans are simple, straightforward, easy to staff, easier to operate, uh, very flexible floor plans. We put a simple grid within the building. It can be easily uh, amended in the future as library needs continue to change. There's a very strong connection to downtown Illinois Street and Route 59. Uh, the parking in this scheme is very convenient to the library entrance, but it's also convenient to downtown. Uh, the on-grade location really solves the accessibility and gives you a lot of flexibility in the long run. Makes the building much friendlier to enter into, much clearer, and the same for everyone, whether you have accessibility challenges or not. Uh, a few things we thought still needed to be worked on. We'd still like to inch the parking counts up higher. Uh, we want to offset the access drive from 59 so we don't get the crossover. And we want to improve the separation between kind of where we have the drive up window at this point and where the main entrance is. It's better, it's off the end of the building, but you still have traffic coming out across where you have a fair number of people who will be walking up to the building. Next slide, please. Next. So when we went in to design the building in more detail, other than just this approach to the site, we were working with the program consultant to kind of tighten up the spaces, get us from that 90,000 square feet down to 75,000 square feet. And one of the areas we found that we could really save space was in the meeting rooms. Libraries these days have a lot of programs. Uh, your library has a fair number of programs for its size. When we open a new building, there'll be a lot more programs because this is something libraries are moving towards. Uh, there's a need for sometimes 250 to 300 people quite often 100 people, even more often 50 people in meetings. One of the things we found that we could do in working with Julie was to combine three meeting rooms together and use movable walls to separate them or to join them. Now a movable wall is something that's more of a, the whole wall slides up, it's not an accordion panel, it's far superior acoustically to that. So it gives you a true sense of, of, of being separated in the different rooms, but when you open it up, you can take advantage of having all three of those rooms adjacent. So in this plan here, we've got a meeting room at the side here with a movable wall. We've got a terrace seating area, which I'll show you a little bit more in a second. Then we've got a center area, and it's pretty much surrounded by movable walls. The center area, you can, you can put one of these walls down and you get easily 150 people in that room plus another 50 in the other space. Or we can put both walls up and have up to 290 people within that space. So we get a lot more flexibility out of it. It's a lot more interactive and it kind of fits with the model that is, that is merging to the forefront in modern library design. Now down, if you imagine if you cut this through the center and looked into it from the side, we have this section down here. So this is the one room to the, that's here, the center room here, and this is the terrace seating and it's got uh, a tiered level of seating, we're thinking that that could be also used just for a general hangout space by youth and things during the day. It doesn't have to be closed off, it could be an active use area, but it also could serve to have easily kind of a, a, a with the wall down, a discussion that could take place, a book panel, etc. 
But when you open, slide those, all those walls up into the structure above, you get a large space, and then the back half of the room is terraced up so everyone can see well within that same large space. So it really saved us almost 50% of the meeting room space that we were targeting on, so it was a big advantage. A couple of other things I want to point out in this diagram here that is important. As you can see, instead of having just a three-story building at this side, we pulled the upper two stories back. It's something you'll see a little bit more as we go into the building design, but the intent at that point was to, was to lessen the impact of the height of the building on the residential sides of the building, to have more of a transition and set the taller parts of the building back. The other thing is this rooftop uh, mechanical area. Instead of just having mechanical units that sit on top of the roof, and you can put a wall around those, et cetera, but it makes the building look bigger, makes the building effectively taller. Instead of doing that, we're creating a well within the mass of the building where we set the mechanical units down within the well. And that does a couple things. It takes them out of sight. Uh, it, it helps reduce the overall feel of the mass of the building. But it also allows us to treat the walls with acoustical absorbent material and use the walls to direct sound upwards. So it controls the sound from the mechanical units in the area and takes the visual impact off of the neighboring spaces. Next. So we won't go into a lot of detail in the floor plans. We're not showing all the rooms at this point in time. We're kind of showing the general areas of the building. Uh, frankly, that's for a couple of reasons. One is the library doesn't want to spend a lot of money on a, to us <laughs> to develop this while they're waiting to pass a referendum. We develop it as far as we need to to make sure we can make it work, and that's as far as we go on it. Uh, but we do have some major planning concepts that we've gone through with the library. One is this kind of area in the center here designates kind of the main public area, the collection, the lobby, et cetera. That is always going to be located along the south facade of the building. We have a great opportunity with the way the building is situated on the site. We have a lot of access to south light. It's a big advantage these days. And in in sustainability, it's a big advantage. We can bring light into the building. We can turn off lights and reduce the power consumption of the building. Uh, it's also, we can take a, a real advantage along there. Also the meeting rooms are located over in this area and they're directly off the lobby. So we've got all the public spaces off the south side of the building. Along the north is kind of more of the, the back of house space and the staff spaces. There's more of that on the first floor than any other floor because we've got receiving rooms, uh, mechanical rooms, uh, water pump rooms, etc. We also in this case we've put the administrative staff and, and some additional staff areas down in this end. When you come into the building, we want the elevators and restrooms, uh, something we call the core of the building, to be located relatively central in the building. And you'll see this as the building goes up, how that becomes more central. We also have an open stair that's located in the, relatively in the center of the building. You can come in and go up the stair and land over at the other end. That's a way kind of, of repositioning you as you go up the building without kind of uh, having to walk as far. So we get a, a good, flexible, open floor space that can be adapted to future uses as well, and um, a lot of that. The first floor is very active with meeting rooms and, uh, and, and the most popular collection. The second floor is also considered one of our really active floors. This whole floor is given over to youth services and young adult. Uh, it's a large open floor. We expect it to be a little rambunctious. It's not going to be the quietest floor. Uh, there will be spaces that will be laid out within it that will have walls for story time rooms, etc. We will have early literacy and learning, a tech center, group study rooms, uh, story time rooms, parenting collections, grade school collections. There's a lot of things that are going to be expanded upon that the library has and then more spaces than what they have now for, for these new activities. You know, uh, used to be when the library was designed originally, they wanted you to go in, get your book, and leave. Now people drop their kids off at the library. They expect them, they can spend four hours there easily. There are activities going on and things. But these are things we want to be able to expand upon in the new building. So again, we've got most of the collection located down at the south end of the building, lots of natural light in that area. This area is actually walled off. That's the double height space for the meeting rooms. And we have a staff area that occurs kind of up in the upper corner on each floor. Next floor, please. 
This is the third floor. <laughs> this floor will probably ha be, have a glassed off from the floor below to limit the amount of sound that comes up to it. This is the, what we're calling the adult collection. It has the reference nonfiction and fiction spaces. That includes an information commons, computer training lab, digital media labs, local history, quiet study rooms, tutoring rooms, as well as the collections. Again, it's a big, open, free space where it can be a rearranged readily. We understand the one thing we've learned about libraries is they don't stop changing. They're going to keep changing. They've changed faster than anyone predicted in 1989. They're going to continue to be a source of content. They're also a place now where you go to create content, and that's evolving. So we want to plan this as a, as a simple building that can be adapted as things change in the future. On the far end here, this is that well I was talking about where the mechanical rooms are behind this wall and within a sunken in space within the building. Next slide, please. So this brings us back to the floor plan of seeing how that's developed on the site. Uh, again, this is Lockport along the bottom, Route 59, Illinois Street. Uh, the building's located across the north end of the site. We get the service drive, the one-way service drive that we can have the book drop and a book service and a service window where you can both check out and return books. Uh, we get the service located across the top. We have a lot of parking along the bottom. We've maximized how much parking. We've developed a little bit more of a green area at the entrance to the building. I think one of the key moves we're trying to do is we're trying to soften the entrance to the building. Route 59 is a busy street. We're locating the entrance away from it. We want it to be at the quieter end of the site. We want to introduce some more quiet activities, some green planters and so forth that you can sit at uh, just outside the entry area and transition to kind of more of the residential area that comes off of Illinois Street. Uh, what we're also showing in this scheme is all of these schemes have been predicated upon the library owns one house in this location, has the right to purchase two other houses to expand to, to two other houses to expand the site to this point, and then they also have the right to, pur to purchase two additional houses so that we can get the parking count up higher. This is something uh, that is, I think, not carved in stone. We've talked with the village staff, and they suggested we might not need quite as much parking as we're showing. Uh, what we hear in our, in our survey and so forth is one of the number one issues is we need more parking. So it's something we can work out, but it's something we're budgeting for at this point in time. Right now we're showing parking up here, okay, this uh, north of the library. That would primarily be staff parking and overflow parking at this point in time. But if we take all the staff parking out of here, most times it's going to free up a lot of space for the downtown parking. Next slide, please. We also talked, as we were going through this, we started talking about the exterior of the building. And it was pretty clear we wanted to do a masonry building. And we started talking about some of the overall broad things you can do with masonry. And these are some different buildings that we've done in the past. Uh, not the best projection here, but you know, there are different colors of brick. This is something at the, at the University of Illinois. Every building's the same color. One of the issues you run into down, ter down there is the buildings get bigger. That dark brick starts to become pretty massive. Uh, this was a museum that we did that you can't have any windows in. So one of the things you can do is develop, use stone detailing and patterning in the bricks and things to kind of bring more life to the facade. Uh, this is another building. Sometimes they're the really light buildings take on a little bit of an institutional quality. Uh, you can break that down with the massing, but it's something to, to watch out for. This in-between brick is something that we're quite fond of. It's kind of a softer form brick. It's a, it's a molded brick rather than a machined brick. It gives you a little softer feel uh, to the building, and it's one way to kind of bring, bring a more traditional feeling to a building. So along the way, we've been looking at the way it's developed. Uh, this building on the far left here is not falling down. It's in the middle of construction. <laughs> And uh, we really like that brick that, that's on the, was it, the trolley building? Trolley yes, and we really like that brick. It's very soft and warm. One of the things that's really nice about it is you can see right there in the sun, it kind of glows in the sun. One of the big advantages of our building is we have a great southern exposure. It's kind of on the new library building. It really is going to take on a lot of sun. The facade will really come to life with daylight on it. That's true of half of your main street shows up in the brick patterning as well. I think as we look at 
uh, the, the more traditional part of Main Street, we see some things that we like the idea of, this very strong cornice line that runs around most of the buildings down there. Uh, these old buildings were built differently. They have very thick walls. You can get really heavy shadow. We're going to have trouble getting that heavy a shadow. We're going to have to use more pattern and things to kind of replicate that, but we want to get some of that shadow into it. Another thing is, is we see stone being used selectively. There's not stone buildings so much, but there is stone detail and trim, little things to add a little bit of character to the building <laughs> in all these locations. And then we see these arches that are set in masonry. They're not necessarily glazed in arches. They're arches that are there as kind of almost a pattern work. And it's something that uh, really appealed to us as well. Take the next slide. So this is the, this is the rendering of the library looking from the downtown area to the library. I think uh, you can see across the top, we took the cornice line very seriously. Uh, we've got kind of that patterned cornice, a uh, stone trim across the top. There's, uh, we also worked in some of the arch work into the facade of the building. In this case, at the entrance, it's, uh, it's got glass behind it. You can see through it. It becomes kind of a feature point of the building. On the rest of the building, it's more of a pattern work similar to downtown. Uh, one of the things you, you notice here is there's a lot of glass in the facade. This is typical of newer libraries compared to older libraries. Again, it's a different way of using it. And uh, when you spend a lot of time in buildings, they like to have more natural light. It's more of an active space. It's not necessarily the quiet recluse that libraries used to be. They're very active buildings. You want more light. You also want to be able to see into them. You want to see the activity that's going on in the space. So it's something that's become a feature of library design. Next slide. And this is where we have a movie. If you could run them. I won't, shouldn't say a movie. That's expecting too much. An animation. Uh, this is a 3D visualization of the library. And you're on Route 59 right now. You can see the front. You can see on the front one of the things we talked about the library was in, in introducing these very subtle curves. It's actually segmented straight pieces. We're not curving the glass, but it provides a softening to the whole facade and a little more life to it. Uh, it's something we thought worked out quite well. Here you can see the stone patterning when it's in a solid area. It reads more like that stone that's downtown. This is along Illinois Street. There's the drop off, and we just went through some house. <laughs> There's a covered drop off here for books. We're back to Route 59. The stone, the brick patterning wraps the corner here. Uh, the first story is, is more solid at the, this area because that staff area is it's not as open. And as we look on it, we're back at the parking lot side. If we can go back to the other presentation. And just next slide. So these are some or we kind of staff areas, we have smaller, narrower windows, more privacy, also able to be broken up into smaller offices. Got more of the stone trim and things that's down kind of at the human level. You can, you, you can read that very readily. The upper areas are kind of almost a two-story read, the way we've set back the windows. And we have the cornice around the top. Next, please. This is from the north. You can see that uh, patterning. That the brick pattern that wraps the corner and also the one setback around the building. It's early to, to guarantee this, but one of the things we're looking at, if we can make the budget and everything work, is to introduce some green roof along that level. Building notion, also it softens things as you look out the windows onto these spaces. Next slide, please. So here you can see the kind of brick patterning between the windows and along the top. Uh, this is more of the service area of the library, but there's still a lot of where the drive comes out onto Illinois Street. This is where the, the, the double height meeting room space is and a window at the corner. This end of the building is a little quieter. We know we're facing the uh, residential area. We didn't want to have huge expanses of glass. It's more regulated at these ends. So we've broken up all the facades with some glass along the way so you just aren't facing blank walls. Next slide, please. And then this is back to the, the main view again. Next. So these are uh, what we call elevations. They're flat line drawings that are rendered. Building, it gives you kind of how you can relative, relatively narrow building. 
and that's that's something that is good. allows a lot of light to penetrate into the building um, along the long axis. It's something that we we have to control, but we can also showing you the north side of the building, which you could consider the back of the building, but it's not being treated as such. It's developed in the round. It's it's active. It has windows, bank walls up against. Uh, residential property next and this is the quieter facility there's a what the building looks like at night we say dusk definitely a little darker than the actual drawing but it's one of the things that where you can see into the building you can see activities the, the it really becomes the sign for the building in a way and you can see the arched entrance way here and the arches silhouetted at the corner here and that's a summary of everything, and we, we're open to questions. Julie, can do you want to take architectural questions first, or do you want to no. do yours? Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm Julie. I'm the library director. Most of you probably know me already. So who here remembers 1990? It was an awesome year, wasn't it? It was the year they broke ground on the existing library. And it was 25 years ago when that construction began. And the official population of the library district in 1990 was just over 14,000 people. And there were five schools in district two. Today, the library serves over 75,000 people. And there are more, there are 30 schools in district 202. Uh, we are serving our five times as many patrons with that same 27,000 square foot building that we broke ground on in 1990. When we opened that building, the library had two word processing computers. We still had typewriters for public use. Our collections included cassettes and VHS tapes. Modern email didn't even exist. And today, not only do we have dozens of public computers, we provide more than 23,000 hours of public time annually. We also provide Wi-Fi and power for people to bring their own devices to the library, something never envisioned in 1990. Our formats today include DVD, Blu-ray, um, MP3, books, audiobooks, streaming video, streaming audio, uh, e-readers, Roku's, things that we never have planned on. But libraries are about access. That is just access. We just have many, many more points of access than we did in 1990. The library's physical collection um, is not as much of a focus. We now have over 200,000 items in the library collection, and that is only possible because we don't have to physically house them. People are using libraries so much differently today than they did 25 years ago. Librarians are often asked, why do we need libraries in the internet age? Well, the internet can't provide you personalized help and hands-on instruction like a 21st century library can. In 1990, we did 500 reference questions. We did over 50,000 questions answered 25 times as questions answered now in the internet age. Today's questions are more complex than ever before because that easy answer is on the first page of Google and you found it yourself. The complex questions, the things that require a lot more hand hands-on instruction and help, that's what your librarian is. Classes and programs are another huge part of 21st century library services. 1993 was actually the first year that the library collected any kind of program attendance statistics, and they only counted kids. They had about 2,200 kids come to programs at the library in 1993. In 2015, had over 50,000 people attend a library program somewhere in and that is 22 times as many people attending a library program. 
25 times as many questions answered, 22 times as many people coming to programs. That's what 21st century library services are all about. 21st century library service focuses on continuous learning, on content creation, on making connections between people and among their community. With a smartphone in your pocket that is more powerful than the 1990 supercomputer, people today need help keeping up with the fast-paced changes in technology. They need a place to connect and a place to collaborate, a place to make things, share things. 21st century public libraries are community centers for the way we live today. Our library's been doing a great job in this tiny little building. So what's the, why do we need this today? Well, it's the age and the condition of the current library building that are forcing this to the forefront. Yeah, it looks good. You just look at the surface, it looks just fine. But after 25 years of hard use as a public building, the cost of function continues to rise. Numerous building systems of equipment are past their expected useful life. They are failing on a regular basis. If this proposed building and expansion project fails at the March ballot, addressing those costly long-term repairs and replacements, the building functional will cut into the funds and the space available for library service further. The scope of work needed to keep the building operational in long term triggers compli compliance with today's building codes. The cost of that compliance is high, both in dollars and in space. An estimated more than $10 million would be required to make the urgent repairs to this existing 25-year-old building within the current building envelope to reach full compliance. And to do that, we would have to cut both services and the amount of public space available just the building open. An example, our current boiler room. The boiler, the water heater, and the main electrical panel, I can touch oh. To meet today's codes, that area needs a minimum distance between those pieces of equipment and a physical separation. This would necessitate enlarging the area, building walls, piping, rewiring, and in order to do that, we would have to draw from public space. Further building was built before Americans with Disabilities Act was required for public building. That entry and vestibule does not meet today's ADA standards. Those aisle widths are too small. If you've ever tried to pass strollers in the entryway, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this happens a lot in our library. To redesign that entryway to meet ADA compliance within our existing building envelope, again, we would have to draw from the public space for actual library services to make that happen. We do not have any sort of loading dock. There is no ADA accessible staff entrance. Our accessibility building are many. Approval for the proposed plan at the March 15th primary election would avoid reductions in library services and in our public space, this building functioning long term. Covering the magnitude of repair costs and increasing, without increasing the funds available to the library referendum would require more than 20% cuts in today's operating budget. To put that in perspective, the library's budget today, 78 of that budget, staff and library material, only 20% of our budget, everything else. So a 20% cut would be devastating service. Results of the March 16 primary election will determine the direction of planning by the library board. We're hoping that there will be a 
a way to avoid these cuts. But we're here today to answer any questions that you may have and to answer any questions you may get from your constituents, our shared constituents. <coughs> our goal here is to inform our residents of the plan, how it was developed, why we're moving forward now, and to help you get the answers that you need. I hope you can help us by sharing this information with our citizens uh, to make sure that they have the opportunity to get their questions answered before Election Day on March 15th. And uh, feel free to ask me questions. I am a librarian. Access to information and answering questions is what I do. First off, uh, I want to thank you, Julie and Carl, and the entire team from uh, Nagel Hartray that uh, came on out tonight to uh, present this information to the board and to the community. It was uh, very informational and uh, very in-depth, and uh, I'm walking away with a much greater appreciation myself for everything that you've put into uh, this, this effort. So with that, I'll turn it over to the board and see if there are any questions. There might not be because we, again, we did start off by saying that we don't particularly care to wade into other taxing jurisdictions' waters, but uh, if there are some questions for th from the board uh, that they might be hearing that uh, from their constituents or, or to, uh, to answer any questions as they, uh, they get presented, with Brian, it's a fascinating tour. Uh, I'm, if it's going to be on YouTube, I highly recommend people take a look at it because there's a lot more depth and explanation of uh, things that have been questions that I've heard, and I think a lot of those questions are getting answered. Uh, one question, uh, which you sort of touched on, but uh, you went from 90,000, which I assume was some sort of ar arbitrary target that you thought would work, to down to 72,000 now. Uh, I mean, yet we're still talking about maximum you know, flexibility going forward. What is your sacrifice to get from 90 to 72? A lot of, one of the things that we glossed over uh, was all of the work by Anders Dahlgren, the library building consultant who is not here with us tonight. Um, Anders went through statistics nationwide, um, statewide, and put our library in the perspective of, you know, where do we fit within all of these categories? And where do we want to be? Our, bo our board does not want us to have the biggest library for our side. No, that's not who we wanted something that was pretty middle of the road for the area that we serve. Um, because that's what our constituents see, that's what they're used to. They're used to suburban Chicago area. So we really were focused on the standards for Illinois public libraries. It's called Serving Our Public 3.0. And the uh, square footage per capita is one square foot per capita is standard in the state of Illinois. That puts our library need today at 75,000 square feet with population projection over 100,000 but in 20 years, so needing over 100 by the same as libraries are going virtual services, there is a small reduction in the amount of need. And that reduction is about 1% physical collection per year. But our population is growing at about 1% per year. So one of the ways we were able to offset that planning was to say, okay, we're going to be able to continue to reduce the, phys the physical collection less, but we'll have more people, so we'll need a little more total space. That's where that flexible, efficient floor plan comes in, be able to design, adapt, what we're using in the building, how we're using that space. And it's something that we've frankly gotten very good at because our library is way too small today. So finding those compatible needs for a single space, um, I think what Nagel Hartray did for us 
with finding a way to make three meeting rooms into the one big event space and make it actually functional for us um, is a huge way that we can further reduce what that overall space is. Um, some of the other little things are things like just increase uh, how much shelf direction makes you have to Uh, projections for the future as far as the population growth I know we talked about or you, you guys had talked about the past and now current but there was little on the, on the future what your projections are for 10 and 20 years out as far as population and use the 20-year projection population for our library district is approximately a hundred and nine thousand folks and you probably do know that the library district is larger than the village of field compass the village we also have um, Romeoville that is in Plainfield Township, Bolingbrook that is in Township, all of unincorporated Plainfield Township, and most of unincorporated Township. And so it's quite the dance to put together all of the different population projections. I'd like to thank you and uh, Carl and uh, the Nagel Hartray people for coming out tonight. And uh, every vote counts, so anybody who's watching, uh, go out to the ballot box. 2009, that particular election, that spring election, was one of our record low. There was a, a lot of talk earlier about all the windows in the building, and I guess from, from a layman's perspective, I would just say it looks like a beautifully designed building, so thank you very much for that. Uh, the one question that I did have was in, in regards to the sustainability, was there any plans or talks about um, having a, a LEED certified type of building to have additional, you know, sustainable attributes as part of that? It all has to be proven out going forward. We're generally, we're appro we approach all of our buildings with, with sustainable design in mind. Whether the owner chooses to go through the LEED certification process is something a little bit different. We will definitely be energy modeling and so forth. We'll start out looking at there is a little bit of a cost to achieve certain lead ratings. Usually you can save that money in the long run in operating costs, kind of a balance that we'll try and sort out with the library. But we're anticipating that we, we want to pursue a sustainable building. Well, is this a very informative presentation, very well done, a beautiful mm -hmm. concept. Um, I have not heard personally a lot of questions, but Julie, where do you want to put out there where people can go if they do have specific questions? I'm sure you have a frequently asked questions page on the library site or something where people can get informed. Yes, the library's website is plainfieldpubliclibrary.org. Left hand side in the quick links box, you'll see building and expansion planning. Just click on that, and on that page, you will find literally every from our entire planning process. If you scroll down to the bottom and work your way up, you can actually walk the entire planning process, one document and one section at a time. But also available there are a timeline that includes where library representatives will be throughout the community in the upcoming weeks, including some special drop-in Q&A where I will be available in the library to talk about um, the project and to answer any questions people have. There is also an online questions form right there. So if you have your question, you can put it off to the library and we will answer you. Um, and then there is an FAQ section and any of those questions that we get in, um, try to add those to the FAQ. So it's already pretty long. Thank you. You guys also sent out a mailer, it looks like, to was it to every resident in the district? Yes. That was very, did. very informative. Thank you. Um, did the uh, first special edition newsletter homes in the middle of January. There will be a second special edition newsletter that will be going to homes, um, hopefully right about the time early voting starts in very early February. Um, it's already at the printers, so nice infographic.
I just want to thank you for your presentation. It was very informative. Your model, is that going to be in the foyer of the library? And will there be someone there if there is questions? Well, I don't have enough foyer. <clears throat> Well, another of, thing, as long as the other gentlemen carry it and, yeah. <laughs> and leave. Um, it will be uh, up at the top of the stairs, right across from the checkout desk on top of the DVD shelves. That's where it's living these days. Um, and there are the um, copies of the newsletter available there. Um, I will be, as I said, available at certain times for the, the public drop-in Q&A sessions. We have some bulletin boards for information around the library. I always ask staff whenever you're in uh, whatever questions you have they're pretty good at answering thank you very much thank you so much for having us we really appreciate taking the time Thanks. reminders our reminders uh, February 1st be our next village board meeting the second will be our next planning commission meeting in the 8th will be our next committee of the whole and this meeting will be replayed on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Also available on YouTube on demand? Yes. Okay. We're seeking motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion's been made and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. That motion carries.